Hello and welcome to Conformance Testing the Kubernetes API, tooling that makes the difference. I'm Caleb. And I'm Stephen. We are with II, a group in New Zealand with a focus on cooperative coding. Pairing is sharing for us. You can find us at ii.nz. Who is II? II is made up of the following humans. Myself and Stephen, who are your speakers. Brenda, who makes II function, Pepe, who's the founder of II, Rian, who's the project manager, and Zach, who's the data wizard. So let's talk about conformance and its tooling. What is Kubernetes conformance? A program by the CNCF to ensure that Kubernetes is the same everywhere. With it, you get stable APIs, no vendor lock-in, and portability of workloads. When I run my workloads, I expect them to run the same wherever, no matter the vendor. For general current conformance information about the program, its vendors and distributions, check out cncf.io slash ck. Tooling that makes the difference. We define and verify conformance through tests. Today, we'll show some tooling that II uses to help improve Kubernetes conformance coverage. The primary tools we'll focus on are API Snoop and pair.sharing.io. First, we have the API Snoop suite. The suite is responsible for collecting and processing the data that makes up the definition of conformance, thus allowing community members to generate the data that displays the results for conformance progress and also build out tests. There are three components that we'll walk through. First is SnoopDB, which is a Postgres database that processes the Kubernetes open API spec and any E2E log that you wish to in make it ingest. It runs as a job or it runs live in your cluster for querying. And it also statically renders that data, which is then later picked up by web, which we'll talk about soon. Next is audit logger. This is useful for live test writing. It is a shim that sits between the API server and SnoopDB. It captures logs using a API server audit sync and audit policy to point to itself. And it's also what we use for our live conformance testing development. Finally, we have web, which you might be most familiar with. It's available at apisnoop.cncf.io. This is what picks up that statically rendered data and displays it as some very pretty dashboards and uh, useful statistic information for sharing with the community. Next, we have pair.sharing.io. Over the last year, II has built an open source development environment that runs in Kubernetes. We think it's pretty cool to be working inside of a cluster. Pair, given its name, is about pair programming. With pair, you get in a cluster, with any clusters, any repos that you wish to work with. In our case today, we'll be working with Kubernetes and API Snoop. Thanks, Stephen. Now let's take a look at pair.sharing.io. Here you can see the home page. You're greeted with two buttons after you sign in. The first one is to list all instances and also this button to create a new one. I'm going to go to this one to create a new instance, which will eventually give me a cluster. Here I'm going to input the Kubernetes repo because while we're writing on we're writing Kubernetes tests, and also the CNCF API snip repo so that we have live test writing uh, enhancements. I'm also going to write API snip ticket writing, which is a repo that II uses for all about ticket writing for for conformance tests. I'm also going to invite Stephen as a guest so that we can both pair on it. Normally now I'd hit launch, but since we already have an instance prepared, let's jump to that one. Going to the instance, after clicking this list, you'll be greeted with a page to display a whole lot of information about it, such as its name, the creator, the time when it was created, who it was shared with, and various repos that it's loaded up with. On the right-hand side of the page, you'll see some beneath the metadata, you'll see the sites that are available. Right here, these are ingress endpoints that are exposed in the cluster. 
there's several ways to connect. You can connect through such things as a kube config, uh, through SSH, or even through the web. We have a pre-prepared window up to uh, connect to the pair session right now. So we're going to switch over to that one. Once in, uh, you'll be greeted with uh, a teammate uh, session. Teammate is quite similar to Tmux if you're already familiar with it. Teammate makes those shared terminals, uh, makes those multiplex terminals shared. Uh, with this cluster, you can see that we're actually running the latest version, which is 1.22.1 .1 as of today. If I run hostname, you'll see that this is the hostname for where we are right now, which happens to match this pod, which is the first of this list. So you can see that we're actually working inside of a pod. So that's pretty cool. It's called Humax, which is an Ubuntu base with Teammate, Emacs, and a whole lot of utilities that II uses. You can also see that the uh, you can also see the ingresses that are available. Uh, this list matches the the one for the instance page. Also, you have uh, DNS access to your instance. So you can manage any record that is at your instance name and beneath. What's also special is that you have full TLS across all of the your pair host and subdomains. You also have a web server that is running on www. With this, you're able to, to read and write files into the public HTML folder. This will allow you to expose any files that you wish. And uh, yeah, we'll look more into this later. It comes in handy. Let's take a list of uh, all of the pods that are running right now. As you can see at the top, you have SnoopDB and Audit Logger. Those are the components from earlier. And we're going to use them again very soon. Why don't you tell us about Emacs and Org Mode, Stephen? I think that there's some very interesting things that we can do with that. Yes, Caleb, there's a ton of things that we can learn from uh, Emacs and Org Mode. Here's a uh, basic document that looks a little similar to Markdown, but with Emacs, we've got some interesting superpowers that we get with Org Mode. So inside of uh, code blocks, not only can we uh, document, uh, sorry, we can both document the actual code, but also the results from them. So here we've got the current working directory, and here's the current pods. So this lines up with what Caleb showed a little bit earlier. The ability to record both the content and the results is uh, pretty powerful, and it helps us to keep on track with what's current and the next things on our checklist. Right, move in a... to the... this document here. This is a starting template that we use when we're looking at starting a new issue around a potential endpoints that for conformance. It's been helped to structure the discussions that we've had with the conformance group and the conformance meetings as well as with SIG architecture. It's been very, very helpful. Down here, when we're looking at testing for new endpoints, we can use API SNOO to ask it what is currently untested. And by running this code block, we can start to document the process around untested endpoints, as well as what's the resources around them. These resources, once we decide that uh, they need to be tested as part of the conformance process, we'll start to look at documenting them and then use the outline here as a way to start to structure how we're going to go about testing this new resource. Once we've got that in place, we would then update this 
uh, basic Go test, uh, test that is currently working around pods to match the new resource. So instead of testing uh, and creating a number of uh, pods and listing them before deleting them, we would end up switching this out for another resource that's going to be part of conformance in the near future. Uh, we can look we can track how the pods uh, interact during this uh, test. So that if we run it, we're going to see the resources being not only started but also terminated. This lines up with the results that we've been given up here. We can talk with uh, uh, and check with how API Snoop has seen these recent um, endpoints being hit in our SQL, uh, SQL query here. The SQL query is showing the create, delete, and the listing. These endpoints have already been tested, so unfortunately, this follow up query will query what is currently going to be a change in test coverage but at this stage there's only 402 endpoints showing full coverage at the moment. Caleb, what happens uh, once we've got this file done? Great question. So we're actually able to export it into different formats to use for different things. For example, we can export it as various formats such as ODT, Markdown, HTML, or GitHub flow markdown. Along with the many more that there are, I'm going to export it as HTML so I can view it on the web. Now that it's exported, I'm going to go to this folder and then copy that HTML file into the, the public HTML folder. From here, we're able to navigate back to pair.sharing.io. Once on pair.sharing.io, we're able to go to the www subdomain and view any files on it. So I'm going to go to there. And then I'm going to go to the, the file that I put in there, which is called mock template.html. Now I can view it in reasonably nice rendered HTML format. This will enable quick review for anybody, no matter what device that they're on. Uh, we, yeah, we, we use this occasionally. And uh, another thing that we can do if I jump back to Emacs is if I go to the org file and then I export it again, I'm going to this time export it to GitHub flavored markdown. And then from there, I'm going to once again go back to uh, copy it to the public HTML and then return to pair.sharing.io and go to that subdomain, and then go this time to Markdown. From here, what I'm able to do is I'm able to create a GitHub ticket out of this, which I paste the contents of that into this box. You can see right here that the ticket is rendered, and it shows all of the steps of why do we need it, what it is, how we achieve it, and so forth. And Proving it. From here, we're able to bring this up into uh, discussion at, at the conformance meetings, if not beforehand. We, we would also be committing this and pushing it to a branch for further review. But I wonder, what if there's an existing endpoint which just needs to be upgraded to conformance and stable? What can you tell me about that, Stephen? Yes, Kyle. Uh, once we've got a test that's actually part of the Kubernetes code base, we'd be looking at um, discovering where it is in 
the uh, code base and I've got an example here in the diamond set. This uh, endpoint here has got a name, uh, a, a description inside of the name uh, quotes here at the top. And with that um, set of information, I can go back to a org file I've got. org file here that's got the daemon set status and I'm going to run it at the moment and it, no endpoints have been hit at the moment but based on the based on that um, description that's in the top there we can go across to here and uh, put that information into a variable and then look at running a Ginkgo uh, focus test using the E2E test binary. This is um, testing the daemon set um, status and using some watches to check that various events have happened. With it, once it's passed, I can go back to the uh, query that we've got here on the block and when I rerun it, I can find a number of endpoints that have been hit. This helps us to clarify with the conformance group um, and the appropriate SIG. In this case, it was SIG apps that we've worked with uh, with a number of uh, daemon set um, endpoints in this last release. And we're able to confirm that everything's looking great. So Kate, once I finish all my work, what would I be thinking of doing next? Yeah, of course. So once we're finished doing our work, we, we end up pushing it away and making sure it's committed and saved. And then we make our way to pair.sharing.io once more. And then uh, we can hit this big red button, uh, which ends up deleting our instance. This will uh, delete our cluster and uh, mean that we'll have a fresh one for the next day. Why is it important to have a fresh instance every day? Because we want to make sure that our development environments are not pets. This will increase automation and knowledge of how to work on the project. And it will also keep our configurations up to date and in sync and shared with everyone. So that's Pear. would like to give a special thanks to all of the conformance contributors who have, uh, and community who have helped us get to 77% conformance coverage, which is really awesome. I'd also like to thank anyone who's contributed to make any endpoints stable or generally available. Uh, Here are some useful links that you may wish to check out. Uh, the top three are around the, around the conformance uh, testing program, uh, ways to help out and also what's required to make sure that your cluster is certified um, for a particular release of Kubernetes. The last one uh, further enhances the discussion around testing and how to find endpoints and just clarifying the process that we've shown in part here today. Next, if you'd like to get in contact, please reach us via the Kubernetes Slack on the Kate's Conformance channel. That's where you'll find the Kubernetes Conformance Working Group. There's also the Google group and email that you can uh, send emails to, which is on screen right there. We'd like to give a special shout out to a number of open source projects that have helped not only the uh, test writing process become a lot easier, but also uh, for presenting this uh, talk, Reveal JS is really awesome, and we're able to drive it through org mode. 
Thank you to those who attended live and those who have decided to watch later. We hope to hear from you and we hope that this talk has helped you. Let's move on to some live Q&A. Uh, 